Welcome to History Nebraska's Brown Bag History Learning Series. Talks are held monthly on the third Thursday in the Old Father Family Auditorium in the Nebraska History Museum, downtown Lincoln. Learn more about History Nebraska and our programs and services at historynebraska.gov. If you are not a member of History Nebraska, I encourage you to join. Your support allows us to provide programs like this, the Brown Bag Lecture Series, free for all Nebraskans. And for a full list of benefit, benefits to membership, visit our website. Special thanks to Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for their financial support, which allows us to tape and broadcast these programs across the state. We'd also like to thank LNKTV, a service of the City of Lincoln, which provides these programs. If you would like to watch previous brown bag lectures, visit the History Nebraska YouTube page at www.youtube.com slash History Nebraska and see the playlists. Our topic today is suffrage journalism and our speaker is Eileen Wirth. Dr. Eileen Wirth is a History Nebraska board member and author of the book on Nebraska's women journalists from society page to front page. She is a professor emeritus of, the, of journalism at Creighton University and a former Omaha World Herald reporter. She has asked that we save our questions to the end. Uh, she'll leave plenty of time for questions. Thank you. notice that I am dressed in uh, a costume from the 18, uh, supposedly from the 1880s. I want to welcome you to the 1880s because that's the period that I'm going to focus on today. And before I get into the two major people I'm going to be talking about, I want to do just a little bit of scene setting about both women in Nebraska and the suffrage movement and journalism in Nebraska. Okay, since all of you are scholars of Nebraska history, you know that 1880s was one of our periods of biggest growth. And one of the most rapidly growing industries in the state, or certainly one that was growing fast, was journalism. Lots of exciting things were happening. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview, Omaha's population, something like more than double during the decade. Uh, commerce was booming. Stores were starting everywhere. Um, Journalism was establishing, there were newspapers, many of towns had a couple of newspapers, mostly sponsored by political parties. And one of the hottest issues in the state was women's suffrage. Now, we got an early start on this when uh, Amelia Bloomer spoke to the territorial legislature in 1855, and unfortunately they ran out of time to give us the, uh, uh, the honor of being the first state in the country to give women the vote. Uh, in 1871, the Constitutional Convention considered suffrage, and the newspapers had a field day on it. I've been spending a lot of time on this recently because I'm writing another book on the history of Omaha women. And so I dug into the local coverage of the convention, which was held in women. And one of the WAGs suggested that, well, they would give women the vote, but they would deny it to men. That went nowhere, of course. <laughs> Um, some of us who are old remember how the women's movement was treated when it began in the 1970s. A lot of the stuff you read on the early days of coverage of suffrage uh, resembles the coverage that the women's movement received back in its earliest days. So you kind of have to realize men were having a hard time taking this seriously. The suffrage movement in Nebraska, like every place else, was fed by the temperance movement uh, for the reasons that I'm going to talk about in just a half a second. But the temperance movement was also one of the reasons why Nebraskans kept defeating it. Only guys could vote. And the real hotbed of anti-suffrage movement in Nebraska was Omaha, which had half a dozen, they had, Omaha was noted for its vice. 
let's face it, we were a wide open town and we had bars and we had prostitutes and the city was pretty much run by the under side. Well, anyway, they were all in bed with the politicians. And the temperance movement did not go over well with Omaha's ethnic settlers who liked their beer and they liked their wine and brewers were a major industry. So consequently, the fact that the women's suffrage movement was tied in with temperance had a lot to do with its defeats. Now, women started getting involved in journalism at about the time Nebraska became a state. And in the 1880s, uh, Joseph Pulitzer nationally had started introducing women's pages because the advertisers were really upset they were losing their primary shoppers, the women. The newspapers at the time were full of crime and politics and they were almost impossible to read. Trust me, in researching this book, I spent a lot of time with the History of Nebraska newspaper microfilm collection. And it's amazing that I am still able to see you guys. They were just awful to look at. There was nothing for women in them. And so uh, in the early 1880s, the Omaha World Herald hired its first woman columnist, who is my journalistic hero, a woman named Elia Piety. She was an ardent suffragist, and she ran for the Omaha School Board unsuccessfully. It was the only office for which women could vote uh, and run for office. Uh, and she wrote columns about suffrage. So she was a strong proponent of suffrage. You also, in the smaller towns, some of the newspapers, early newspapers, were run by women, often very young women. My good friend Maxine Mal told me she's going to be nominating a woman for the Nebraska Journalism History uh, Nebraska Hall, Women's Hall of Fame in Journalism, who was only 15. I was going to mention today one of the early suffragette supporters was a woman named Rosa Hudspeth, who was from Stewart, Nebraska, up in northeast Nebraska. She was not real popular in her town. Her paper was sponsored by one of the political parties. She couldn't make friends with the other middle class women, and she supported suffrage. So she kind of got, she lost her political sponsorship and kind of got run out of town. So you have a certain amount of ingrained hostility to suffrage in the state. The state's the Omaha's two most important editors, Edward Rosewater and Gilbert Hitchcock, were both opponents of suffrage. Uh, in fact, they both debated. One of them debated Susan B. Anthony when Nebraska was holding its 1882 suffrage referendum, and the other one debated, debated a lesser known suffragette. But they drew big crowds, and unfortunately, their side won. Now, I want to get to are two major suffragette journalists. The first of them is, they're both wild, crazy, radical women. One of them is named Clara B. Wick Colby, and she was, ran a suffragette newspaper out of her home in Beatrice. Now, I have to give you a little bit of my personal history with this. When I was a freshman at the, or a student at the university, I discovered early on that the people at what we then called the State Historical Society were a lot nicer to undergrads than the people at Love Library when you had to do research for a history project. I was a history minor. So I quickly discovered that if I went to what I now call our building, I got much better treatment than if I suffered through, I won't exactly say the hostility, but it was certainly not excitement to see me show up at Love Library. So I spent a lot of time there as an undergrad. It's one of the reasons I agreed to be on the board. Anyway, um, one of the staff members said, well, did you know, she knew I was a journalism major, she said, did you know that we had a suffragette newspaper in Nebraska out of Beatrice in the 1880s? And I'm going, you're kidding. And of course, it wasn't on the assigned list, so I didn't pursue it. But I never forgot that. I thought, how bizarre. And when I came to write this book in, uh, 10 years ago, uh, I remembered that because I knew very little about the subject I was writing about. It was kind of like jumping off a cliff to, to do it. And so I thought, aha, what about that suffragette newspaper that somebody at the History Society told me about in the 1960s? <laughs> anyway, bottom line was it became one of the major things that I ended up researching. Clara B. Wick Colby, was born in England 
and she graduated from the University of Wisconsin. She was valedictorian of her class, and she took subjects that had only been allowed to men. The university hired her for a teaching position, but she quit because her pay was not equal. Go figure. The book I'm reading now is about a BBC reporter who was organized their fair pay initiative. The problems haven't changed. Um, she moved, she got married, moved to Beatrice, and she invited Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to speak there in 1878. Uh, and she became one of so-called Elizabeth Cady Stanton's so-called girls. Um, the suffragettes were not getting good coverage from the state's major media. Go figure with the two major newspaper editors arguing or debating with the suffrage movement. And that was in 1882. So maybe it's just a coincidence. But in 1883, Clara Bewick Colby started her own newspaper out of her own house, the Woman's Tribune. And she, it became the official journal of the suffrage organizations in both Nebraska and in Kansas. And for three years, it was the national woman's suffrage publication. Now, Historically, it's very important because it lasted until 1909. She'd moved away from Beatrice, but she kept it going until 1909. It is the nation's second longest running suffragette newspaper. Um, and the other thing she did, besides the fun stuff I'm going to tell you about in a second, was she carried full text of all the major documents of the state Nebraska and the Kansas and the national suffrage movements at their conferences. So it is a major source of information on the suffrage movement for historians. And a little plug for our sponsor, um, they get to use the same impossible microfilm that I did, unless those have all now been digitized, which I hope. But it is a major source of information on the suffrage movement, so it's historically important. But when I was spending hours, I read every single edition. Let me tell you, that was not easy. I read every edition, and in doing this, I became aware that she was what was called a big picture suffragette. Now, Women in the 1880s had severely limited rights. One of the reasons the temperance movement was so big was because women who had alcoholic and abusive husbands had really no rights even to their children. Uh, we would not have wanted to be women in the 1880s. Uh, if a woman lived on a farm, her husband owned the income. She could control the property that she brought into a marriage, but farm earnings belonged to her husband. That didn't change until our era. Um, basically, women were almost the property of their husbands. Not only couldn't they vote, but they, if they worked outside the home, teachers, for example, women teachers had moral codes that didn't apply to men. They didn't get paid. Nobody got paid, women never got paid what men did. It was really a pretty terrible world for women. Now, some suffragists were focused just on winning the vote. But Clara B. Wick Colby was interested in improving the lives of women very broadly. So she filled her paper with all sorts of information that had seemingly very little to do with the, getting the vote. She was really interested in empowering women. One of her big things, which you find, was she really wanted women to control their own financial destiny so they would have more freedom. So among other things, she would offer instruction in becoming a beekeeper um, or growing silkworms. Try imagining growing silkworms on a Nebraska farm. Okay, she was interested in the total lives of women. And so, for example, uh, she had stuff in her suffrage newspaper that you would say, what? For example, like she had a very detailed instructions in how to build a fire using corn cobs. She carried material on health. 
she had one column which I loved about a doctor. You know, women, this is actually a pretty modified costume, okay? Uh, but women at that time were wearing these awful corsets and they had bustles and I mean you look at the the attire that they were wearing and you go oh my god so she had a column with a doctor who said we wouldn't treat a horse as badly as we treat women wearing the outfits they're wearing and so she had all kinds of advice for women on how to dress more comfortably. She carried social news because the suffragists, you can imagine, in the small towns that Rosa Hudpeth got run out of, there were probably not a lot of suffragists in a lot of those towns. And so this newspaper gave them a community. She would write about their engagements and their weddings. And if somebody went to a conference, she carried reports on that. One of my favorite items, since there was a strong linkage between suffrage and temperance, she carried a story about the, all, the woman's temperance harmonica quartet that performed all over the state. They sang temperance songs for audiences all over the state. I am picturing what a lively evening that must have been with the harmonica quartet followed by probably lemonade. I'm sure they had a great time. Um, you find all these wonderful little oddities, like writing about an all-woman artillery battery at Firth, Nebraska. Who would have ever figured that? Uh, she gave women a lot of legal advice because that was one of her major <coughs> concerns, particularly on their property rights and on just uh, what to do if they felt they were having a problem. So her Woman's Tribune was really an all-around newspaper that did <coughs> wonderful, gave women wonderful advice, and it gave them a community. Now, her husband turns out to be a total jerk who was not faithful to her. They moved to Washington, D.C. in uh, 1889, and she continued publishing the paper from there. Uh, eventually, when she found out about his infidelities, she divorced him. He was an attorney, and he had a big job in Washington. She divorced him, and eventually she moved to Portland, uh, Oregon, and she died there uh, in, uh, she died there without ever casting a vote, which was the sad fate of the early suffragettes. Very few of them got to ever cast votes. She is in the Nebraska Women's Journalism Hall of Fame, and the Beatrice Library, if any of you get down there, has a really nice collection of her stuff. And Lorene Redesell, the librarian in Beatrice, um, does an incredible presentation imitating her. Lorene's a lot better than I am. So anyway, our second major suffragist journalist was Retta Child Dorr. She was another wild and crazy woman. Okay. Um, she was born in Omaha. Her father had been a Civil War doctor, and she was born after the Civil War in Omaha. And she uh, became a suffragette, I think, the day she was born. Uh, when she was only four or five, and if she heard the neighbors coming in and saying that how disappointed they were that they'd had a little girl, she would jump up and down and shriek, little girls are as good as little boys. Now, when she was about 12, um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton came to Omaha, probably in connection with the 1882 referendum. They, were quite, they, they did quite a bit in Omaha then on that state issue. And she sneaked out of her house, and her parents discovered she had joined the Suffrage Association when they read the paper the next morning. That tells you quite a bit about her. The family moved to Lincoln, uh, and she attended the University of Nebraska for one year, where uh, my good friend Ruth Brown, who I, I guess I don't see Ruth here, so anyway, Ruth was telling me, Ruth looked up in the uh, yearbook, the Sombrero, that she was one of the founders of an organization for women who did not need men. Okay. Uh, <coughs> she read 
Henry Gibson's A Doll's House in a literature class. And I, I'm sure most of you have read that, although it's probably been a year or two for most of you. But it, the gist of it was women needed to be economically independent. This inspired her to drop out of the university, and much to the horror of her upper middle class family, she got a job at the post office. And at the post office, she developed a social conscience. Lincoln had immigrants from all over the world, and for the first time, she was exposed to people very unlike herself. And so she worked at the post office for a couple of years, and then she had had it with Nebraska. She was going for bigger pastures. She goes to New York to study art, but ends up as the society editor of a New York newspaper. New York had numerous newspapers. Now, by now, it was about the time of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, which killed all sorts of immigrant working women, young women. And <clears throat> even though she was a, quote, society editor, Retta Childdor used her position to advocate for these young women. She also, because she was from an upper class background, got con them connected um, with upper class women's organizations. She brokered an alliance with these groups who then started advocating for the needs of these uh, immigrant working women. So you can see that like Clara B. Wick Colby, Retta Childdor was a big picture feminist and suffragist who was really interested in the welfare and improvements in the lives of women, particularly those who were not as fortunate as she. Um, after a while, she left New York. Oh, she got married but divorced her husband because he wasn't supportive of her career. She had a child who she sort of left some relatives to raise, you know, that wasn't, I mean, she loved this kid and she paid attention to him, but it wasn't her, she had other priorities. Okay, so at one point then she goes to Europe to study the suffrage movement and she became <clears throat> a ghostwriter for Emmeline Pankhurst. If any of you remember Mary Poppins, do you remember the movie Mary Poppins and the Suffragette song, Take Heart for Mrs. Pankhurst Has Been Clapped in Irons Again, if any of you remember that. Okay, that was the person she became very close to. She was the, <clears throat> the most radical leader of the British suffrage movement. And um, basically, Retta did a lot of her writing for a couple of years. She comes back to the United States in 1912 or 1913 and became the first editor of the Suffragettes. Uh, this is a newspaper of the newly formed Congressional Women's Union uh, Suffrage Association. By now, the Suffrage Association had sort of given up on the state-by-state -state approach. It didn't work in Nebraska, and it didn't work in other states very well either. So this national organization, the women's movement, or the suffrage movement, decided that they were going to try to persuade Congress and the president to approve what eventually became the 19th Amendment. That was going to be their new priority. <clears throat> now, the president in 1913 is one Woodrow Wilson. Now, I've got to tell you, I don't like Woodrow Wilson, OK? <laughs> there are lots of reasons why I do not like Woodrow Wilson. Um, <clears throat> he was, among other things, a racist who um, resegregated civil service activities in the federal government. African-American employees could no longer eat beside white employees in government cafeterias, and it goes on from there. Uh, he was also, he loved women who flattered him. Okay, Retta was not going to be his gal, okay. Uh, and later during World War I, he was responsible for some of the biggest assaults on freedom of speech uh, in our history. 
uh, the anti-German hysteria. That was a Woodrow Wilson special. Okay, so I will be honest. I do not like Woodrow Wilson. And when I am reading all this stuff about Red a Child Door, <clears throat> and I discover that her biggest moment in the national spotlight was she led a march of these women's club people. These were upper class women. And Wilson normally scorned suffragettes. He wouldn't meet with them or anything. But these were upper class club women. In other words, he thought they were his kind of women. Little did he know who had been assigned to lead this march. So picture the scene, it's 1913. The Democrats control everything. Uh, they control both houses of Congress and Wilson was a Democrat. And at the convention where Wilson was nominated in 1912 in Baltimore, uh, they had basically kind of fudged on this, the issue of suffrage and sort of said, well, Wilson's thing was, I'm in, if I were voting on it in my state, which was New Jersey, I would vote for it. But of course, he wasn't going to lift a finger to do anything about the needed national amendment. So having secured this invitation to go into the White House on a hot summer day, Picture 500 society women dressed in gold and white, the suffrage colors. They go in the White House, and before Wilson emerges, they are told what they are to do. They are about shaking his hand, and he's going to give them tea. It's all very genteel. He emerges, and I wish I could stand outside in front of this platform. I would stand there, and I would go. And Reza Child Door emerges as the leader, and she confronts him. And she says, Mr. President, what are you going to do about a suffrage amendment? Are you going to support it? And he sort of hems and haws, and then she, they have this colloquy. In other words, she keeps asking him questions about the Baltimore uh, platform, and he has changed his mind on other things. Why isn't he going to change his mind on suffrage? And he hems and haws some more. And then she talks about, all the states she hopes will be giving women the vote before the next election, and how if he doesn't support the suffrage amendment, guess what, he might not get their votes. So it goes back and forth, and finally Wilson, who is not noted for his sense of humor, to put it mildly. You've all seen the pictures of him, he looks sour. Anyway, Woodrow Wilson finally says, I have had enough of this. I do not have to account to you. And he gets all flustered, and he doesn't shake a single hand. He marches back into the White House, and his aides follow like good little soldiers. And the women are sitting there sort of going, what? And Retta Chaldor is in her glory. She has just confronted the President of the United States. It's going to be on the front page of the New York Times and a bunch of other newspapers uh, because the White House is going to give transcripts of this. The pay reporters were not allowed to cover it. But basically, and a lot of people are very upset with Retta Child Door. They, said, they thought she was rude to the president. Not that rudeness ever particularly bothered Retta Child Door. I mean, she was a fearless woman. And so she says, this is great. We're going to make the front page of every newspaper in the country. Our cause will be heard, if nothing else. There was another suffrage group that was lots less militant, and they attacked her for her behavior and said, oh, no, Mr. President, we really just want your support, and we're the, basically we're the nice women. And she's sitting there telling him, hot damn, we did it. And so there, this goes back and forth. But the bottom line is she did draw national attention to the proposed amendment. Wilson did nothing to support it. Not a single woman got to shake his hand, and he did not give them tea. But uh, the episode has gone down as one of, I think, the high points in the suffrage movement's efforts to get national at uh, uh, attention. Um, suffragists continued demonstrating outside the White House uh, throughout World War I. Um, Retta Child Door remained editor of the newspaper for 
about a year before she quit and went on to do other suffrage work and other work. Um, she was militant on behalf of women journalists. When the war started, she wanted to cover uh, the front lines to be a war correspondent because, among other things, her son was fighting in the war and she wanted a chance to see him. So she goes to Europe and she tries to pull strings and one of the people she worked with was John, uh, General John Pershing. Pershing's sister Mary edited a newspaper in Lincoln. We all know Pershing's Nebraska Ties. So she got, as she said, <coughs> as close to the front as her gender handicap would allow, which is to say she didn't get to where the actual shooting was going on, but she was not sitting at a tea room in Paris either. So uh, when the Russian Revolution broke out, she did get to go to Russia, and she covered what was called the Women's Battalion of Death, which was engaged in actual fighting. And she wrote stories that newspapers carried about this. Um, eventually, after the war, she uh, moved to Europe, uh, and she wrote a number of books. Now, Love Library has these books. When I checked them out to research this book, I was the first person in 50 years to read them. One of them was about the battle of working women, the working immigrant women and their fight for fair treatment in the workplace. Another one was her autobiography. And she ends it, it's in the 1920s, and she ends it by saying that she hopes that the women of the future will have a better life and be able to make more contributions than the women of her era had been able to make. Now, unlike Clara B. Wick Colby, she of course lived to see suffrage, but she never stopped fighting for the rights of women. Uh, and I see that Ruth Brown has come in, and this is the reason Ruth and I have nominated her for the Nebraska Women's Journalism Hall of Fame. We think it would be wonderful if we installed uh, our second major suffragist journalist uh, on the centennial of women getting the vote. Now I want to tell you one final little story and then I'm going to answer your questions. Um, I grew up on a farm in Nebraska City and hard as you might think this is to believe, uh, I come from a family of strong women. Shock. On both sides. My dad's mother was this very feisty little Irish woman. She's about my size, and uh, Grandma Worth was a pistol. Her maiden name was Margaret Agnes O'Brien. And every now and then, Grandma would go on, a, she would start ranting about something. And one day after school, she was ranting about suffrage. She had been, as a young woman, she had been, as much as a farm woman could, she had been a suffragist. And she was furious that Gilbert Hitchcock had opposed suffrage. And I'm this farm kid in Nebraska City, and she said, and the editor of the World Herald, she, did, she really had things against the World Herald, including the fact that, that they, didn't, they weren't for Kennedy for president. And as a good Irish Catholic, that was all she needed to vote for Kennedy. All right, but anyway, so she was furious when she started thinking about Gilbert Hitchcock. He was this famous, important senator, and he was. Uh, and when it came to vote in 1920, he lost the election. By then we had direct election of U.S. senators. And she said, and nobody could figure out why. And then drawing herself up, she was about my height, she's drawing herself up and she said, we voted him out. And I remember that incident, like being told about the suffrage newspaper, when I started doing research. In fact, for my Women in Omaha book, I was talking to a descendant of the Hitchcock family, and I said, what do you know about Gilbert Hitchcock and suffrage? She said, oh, nothing. I assume he was for it. Well, I dug out the information and discovered about the debate and his role against it, and I thought, 
Grandma was right. Good for you, Grandma. So um, we have <clears throat> this amazing suffrage history. Uh, in looking back on the significance of these women, it wasn't only that they worked for suffrage, although that is how we remember them. I think they showed future generations of women, particularly in journalism, that <clears throat> advocacy is very, can be very much and should be part of journalism. I wish when I had been a very young, one of the first women at the World Herald on City News and started covering the women's movement, I wish I had known about them. Um, I felt pretty gutsy in some of the stuff, the stories that I got the paper to do. But if I had known about these amazing women, I think it would have given me a lot of confidence to know that my generation was not the first, that we had had strong, brave women who came before us and who really set a standard for those of us who hope to make an impact on journalism. Thank you so much for your attention, and I will be delighted to answer any questions. And if you, if you ask a question, <laughs> thank you. I will repeat it so everybody can hear. We've got about 10 minutes for questions, 15, 10 to 15 for questions. Does anybody have any questions? I just have a comment. Yes, Ruth. Um, I'm Ruth. We got here late. I apologize. <laughs> um, but I wanted you to know that all of her books, uh, all five of the books anyway, that, that uh, I listed in the, in the nomination are available for free in total online. Um, so one of the ones that I think we're talking about is what 8 million people want. And that was her justification for the 19th Amendment. And it's really worth, worth reading. It's part of Project Gutenberg. Um, and then another one that I enjoyed reading online is uh, her biography, which is a woman of 50. Um, that's not available under Project Gutenberg, but it is available through some university archives. So enjoy your reading. Great. And if you want to torment the staff at Love Library, you can always ask them to go dig it out of the, re unless they have gotten rid of a lot of those books. It took them a week to get it to me because they had to go to, it was, it was not on the shelves. But she's a really a very, very good writer and amazingly modern. Yes, Kathleen. Kathleen Rutledge from the, uh, another Hall of Fame member, and so is Ruth, I should add. <laughs> We're everywhere. Um, I'm just curious about how, how Colby financed her newspaper. Okay. The, the question is, how did Colby finance her newspaper? Colby was married to a wealthy attorney. She had no advertising in it. <clears throat> I'm guessing she scared him into financing it for her. Or she may have had property herself, but she financed it out of her own pocket. She had no advertisers. And I don't know where it was the official publication of several suffrage organizations. They may have contributed something to it. But mostly, she wrote it, laid it out, uh, and I, I assume she hired a printer to print it, but she did it all out of her home in Beatrice. And by the way, uh, in the news business, we used to call it white space, you know, the lines between. There was no white space in this newspaper in a single edition that I read. And the print is very tiny, and if you read every issues, every story, every issue, um, you would learn a lot, but boy, would your eyes be hurting. I remember the series that she ran about women in Egypt seeking their rights. And I'm thinking, this is really pretty interesting for a publication circulated throughout Nebraska. And I'm, I'm sure that the people in York and Humboldt and so forth were just absolutely fascinated to learn about women's rights in Egypt. But that was how broad her mind was. It, it's amazing stuff. <laughs>
Yes, Max. In all of your research, have you seen any indication that the suffragettes thought that a woman could be president? <laughs> I do not think, uh, the question is, in all my research, did I see any evidence that the suffragettes thought that a woman could be president? I saw nothing in everything I read. I think they were just desperately hoping they could get on the local school board. That was probably a lot more realistic, and most of them had trouble doing that. Um, I'm not sure, if you, if you start looking just at state and local politics, Again, this is out of research for my Woman in Omaha book. The first woman, Betty Abbott, who some of you may have known and was a remarkable, marvelous woman. Betty Abbott was the first woman elected to the Omaha City Council in 1964. The first woman was elected to the Douglas County Board in 1992. <clears throat> Just to get people on the Omaha City Council, the Douglas County Board, when I was growing up in Nebraska City, if there were any women on our city council or the Otto County Board, I sure don't remember them. Um, it was really, really tough for women in the era when some of us were young just to get to break through at the Omaha City Council, let alone at the presidential level. Um, the, both political parties, as Maxine well knows, had separate women's committees, and those were separate from the men's committees. Um, the League of Women Voters, happily out here, uh, were organized just to get women to vote. There were a lot of women, including some women that would shock you who were against women getting the vote. For the journalists in this room, uh, one of the nation's leading muckrakers uh, was opposed to suffrage. Uh, I'm having a, a senior moment. Charlene, help me. Uh, who, what? Ida Tarbell was an opponent of suffrage. Can you believe what, the, probably the nation's most outstanding investigative reporter of either gender opposed suffrage. She said she didn't need it, she had enough influence without it. And it was like, okay, all right, well you did bring down John D. Rockefeller, I will give you that. But it was really, really hard. I mean, I think the first woman to get elected to the U.S. Senate was probably Margaret Chase Smith, and that would have been in the 40s. Uh, well, there was one woman, Hattie, whatever, and who got elected. There are a few women who got elected to Congress, but it was really tough for women. To, it still is, as we know. Yes? Just for reference, the first woman who was elected to county commissioner in Nebraska was Jan Gallagher, and then from Lancaster County in 1976. Awesome. Can I, I'm going to repeat that. She said the first woman county commissioner in Nebraska was Jan Gallagher in 1976. Yes. 76. 1976. Okay, I've got to tell you a story about being a young woman reporter. Okay, there was a district in Lincoln that was sort of the woman's unicameral district. Fern Hubbard Orrin represented it. Uh, Calista, was, no, Calista Cooper Hughes, I forget which, okay, and as one of the handful of women reporters, even though I had a master's degree in political science from the University of Minnesota, I knew that if I ever got assigned a political story, it would be dealing with women, and sure enough, when Shirley Marsh ran against Cappy Weber, whom I'm assuming many of you know, Shirley Marsh and Cappy Weber, the only political story I got that year was Shirley versus Cappy, and hot damn, you know, that was just the way it worked. Uh, I can remember when um, Rosalind Carter, when Jimmy was one of about 10 candidates running in the Iowa caucuses. This is how informal and how things have changed. She wandered up to the World Herald newsroom on a Friday afternoon with no press aides and nobody accompanying her, she wandered up 
This is before you even had to go through security. And she said, well, my husband's Jimmy Carter from Georgia, and he's running for president, and I'd like to be interviewed. So they looked around the newsroom, and there I was. So <laughs> at that time, he was one of 10 candidates, and she was the wife of one of the 10 candidates. And who was going to vote for a peanut farmer from Georgia? So I ended up interviewing Rosalind Carter sitting on a couch in the World Health Photo Studio, and it was a broken down couch. But that was kind of the way, if you look at women in journalism and women in politics, we had our own sphere, and it was definitely not the top sphere. So uh, other questions? Yes? Uh, 1920, 100 years ago, was an important year. Yes. It was also an important year for Equal Rights Amendment, which I think was also introduced. Okay, here it is 100. How have we, what's your assessment of that? Well, I was listening to NPR this morning. Morning Edition is an addiction for many of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, she asked, 1920, the Equal Rights Amendment was proposed. And it was proposed by Alice Paul in the National Woman's Party, I believe. She wanted to know my assessment for that. And I was listening to NPR this morning and heard that the Virginia House has approved ERA, and it has assuming it passes, which it will, because the Democrats control the House and the Senate in Virginia, uh, and my ferocious older sister will assault anybody, any male who votes against it. She's back there now. Anyway, um, the question is, this would make Virginia the 38th state, which I believe would ratify, but the question is whether the time ran out on all those early ratifications and if they have to start the process over again. So my hunch is that, given our current leadership, it's probably more symbolic than something that is actually going to happen. Now, when ERA was first proposed, and I covered that as a young reporter, uh, the Supreme Court had not yet applied the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to women. And thanks to our amazing justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a lot of things that were just truly almost unthinkable now, in that, you know, back at that era, uh, had not yet happened. Equal, you know, you, you go through, there's a lot of the law that has changed, and so I, I am still for ERA. I frankly don't have a lot of hope that it's going to become a reality. Uh, certainly it would be a wonderful symbolic thing, but I, I have the feeling that they're probably not just gonna, because it expired in 1982, I believe. So I'm not real optimistic that this means it's going to be added to the Constitution before the 2020 election. We'll see. Yes? Um, just to speak to the ERA in general, you've talked about big picture suffrages versus kind of like more smaller picture suffrages. One of the problems with the ERA, it's something that was proposed by more elite women. It was as you talk about it as a symbolism, whereas for big picture suffragettes, they were looking for more kind of tangible benefits. And it's not totally clear how the ERA would have provided those more tangible benefits that women were working for, like in factories and so on and so forth. Um, his comment, I think, is very well taken, and I'm going to repeat it. I hope I summarize it accurately. That basically, in the suffrage era, we had the difference between big picture suffragists and small picture suffragists. And he's wondering how the ERA, or doubting that it would address some of the economic issues of women. It would be more big picture than small picture. Is that a valid? Yeah, what you said, but yes, the working class women, it's not totally sure what kind of tangible benefits it would have for women, you know, in terms of like um, pregnancy. Okay, he's saying that he's not sure what it would do for working class women like as far as pregnancy rights and some of the working rights issues and so forth. Now, 
remembering back to the ERA era, um, and interestingly enough, a lot of the objections to ERA and to suffrage were very similar. And one of them was that women would lose protections. When I started in every workplace that employed more than X number of women, you had to have a couch so we could go lay down. <laughs> I'm serious. I could tell you where the one was at the World Herald. Um, and there were things like that. Um, and I'm guessing I think that if, if ERA became a serious possibility, and I'm not sure right now that it really is, because I'm, I'm guessing you probably would have a hard time not restarting the process. But I think you would have a lot of study and a lot of look at what the contemporary w impact would be, because so much has changed since the height of the ERA and the Year of the Woman, and you know, some of us attended the massive demonstration at the Nebraska State Capitol building. Now, um, Sharon is holding up, we have five more minutes, so let's say we have time for one more question. Who would like to be the brave soul? Yes. I'm curious, the suffragette newspaper out of Beatrice, what was the extent of its circulation? How, the numbers, uh, how did it get distributed? Um, that's a very good question. The, the suffragette paper in, in Beatrice, how was it distributed and what was its circulation? I never did see a circulation figure, but newspapers at that time were distributed by railroad. And you had branch office, you know, branch lines. I worked at the railroad for eight years, and you had branch lines for every town in Nebraska. So all newspapers were distributed by, news, by railroad, and I'm assuming that, unless maybe in Beatrice she might have had it hand carried, but in most of the towns, and remember it did circulate nationally and certainly in Kansas, so it would have been done by train. Oh, no, 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 nowhere near that. If there were 15 or 20, I think she would have been doing very well. And remember, she wasn't making any money, and so circulation would not have been, she, I, I don't think she sold it. I think it was probably given away to members of the associations. So if she printed too many copies, it probably would have cost her money. We have, do we have time for one more question? Okay. <coughs> Yes. And Helen was elected to the city council in 1959. She's a league member, of course, and then elected uh, the, the, uh, the mayor as well in 1975, was it? I'm not sure about that. 86. 86. Served on the city council all those years. Oh. Okay, I want to, she mentioned the wonderful Helen Busalis, who was elected to the city council in what year, did you say? 1959. 1959. So Lincoln was always a little more enlightened than Omaha when it came to electing women. Yes, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> and then she became mayor, what was the year, did you say 19? And of course, she and Kaor were we had, I think, what was then the nation's first all-woman gubernatorial contest. And um, it's interesting how many of the women who ran for office came up through the League of Women Voters. And uh, I'd like to thank you. I know we're out of time now. I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience. I have enjoyed this very much. And I will stay around for a few minutes before Lance claims and several other History Nebraska board members have come in. I would like to thank them. And I'd just like to thank all of you for coming. I've enjoyed it very much.